Bulovinaka, namaste and good evening. Yet another evening of uh, straight talk here on Fiji Village. I'm Vijay Narayan, yet another party leader. Uh, tonight we have Unity Fiji leader Savinada Narumbe. Uh, Mr. Narumbe has uh, been a former governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji. He's been a former permanent secretary for finance, worked at the World Bank, uh, has worked for the International Monetary Fund, former chairman of RBF, former chairman of FNPF, former chairman of Revenue and Customs Service, former chairman of Fintel, FSM, Fiji Reinsurance Company and Rakavi Trust. He's also a former trustee of the Fiji Rugby Union and former director of ATH, TFL, FEA, which is now known as EFL and FSC. Mr. Narume, thank you very much for accepting our invitation on behalf of our listeners and viewers tonight. Thank you, Vijay. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to a good discussion. Thank Great. you. Unity Fiji started before the 2018 general elections. You got 6,896 votes, which equates to about 1.52% of the total votes. You are back in the race. Uh, in these elections with a the theme, Restoring Hope and Freedom. The 5% threshold applies. If you don't make 5% of the total votes, and in this case, uh, we, the, based on the number of uh, total registered voters, would be around 30,000 plus vote, uh, votes you need to get. Why do you feel that it is necessary for Unity Fiji to come in to lead Fiji? Well, you referred to the 2018 election. Uh, I think uh, that election has, uh, is now in the past. We have moved forward uh, quite a lot from the 2018 elections. In the 2018 elections, we had just registered the party, and uh, it, is, it was a new party, so we need to organize ourselves and then go out to seek awareness of the population. We had only about six, six months. So I'm asking that for Unity Fiji, we forget about 2018, it's the past. It's the past. This is the election that we need to, to focus in and we are quite well prepared, much prepared than we were in 2018. So for us, the, the votes that you quoted, uh, I think will be uh, exceeded multiple times. And that's the feedback we're getting on the ground. Your theme when is... people are recognizing ourselves, recognizing our track record, recognizing what we can do. Your so that's a big change. Your theme is restoring <clears throat> hope and freedom. That's the theme of the manifesto, restoring hopes and freedom. We think that uh, this country has gone through some very, very tough times, difficult times and uh, gloomy times, and they don't see much ahead of them. No one has articulated something that they can have, grab it and have it as, as a hope to their future. So we need to bring hope uh, back to the people and we need to restore freedoms. Freedoms that have been removed, diluted, uh, you name it, it's there. So we need to bring back that, uh, that freedom as well. So that's why we're calling the manifesto as restoring hope and freedom. How many candidates are you expected to field? We're expecting to fill 55 candidates. Uh, we are going through the process of nomination. As you know, it closes on uh, Monday, I believe, yes. next week. Uh, so we're going through the, the documentation of, uh, of nominations. But I must say something. The $1,000 levy on candidates is too, too big. It's too large. You know, to me, that doesn't promote people, encourage people to come and stand in an election. In a country as of Fiji with the per capita income that we have, $1,000 is excessive. They need to reduce that. And when we get to government, we're going to reduce uh, that uh, levy on, on candidates. Candidates uh, also, Vijay, uh, there is reluctance for candidates to step forward. Why? I think that's a big element of fear here in this country. Fear that if they support another party, they will be, uh, government will, uh, of course, take them to, to task. 
businessmen are there and also people that have jobs. They're quite fearful. Why would we be fearful in this country? You tell me. This country needs to remove this climate of fear. And we, we will need to do that. You know, a beautiful country like Fiji, fearful. And fearful, that fear that has been instilled by this government. So that's two elements on, on candidates. One is the fee, one. The second is, uh, of course, the climate of, of fear. Mr. Narumbe, are you still deciding to, who to work with? Uh, you had a working arrangement with the Fiji Labour Party earlier. Uh, you don't have that anymore. You had an MOU with Sodelpa. You don't have that anymore. What's going on? Yeah, that's a good question. What's going on? You know? we, we tried to, to me in 2018, I fully realized that the best position for opposition party is to come together, unite, all of us. So we worked at that. And the MOU with, uh, with uh, Labour, it was for us to work together towards uniting the opposition. That collapsed. Because of uh, a few parties decided, no, they didn't want that. And that to me was uh, quite uh, uh, sad because people want us to be stronger in an election. And that was to me the strongest position if we would come together. So that didn't happen. So and then uh, this Sodel power came uh, to us and said, why don't we work together? I said, fine. We should work together. So that's uh, what we had signed with Sodelpa and MOU uh, a few weeks ago. The management board of uh, Sodelpa, in their own wisdom, decided uh, to, that that MOU should be put aside. So we said, OK, fine. Set your decision. We'll put that aside. So that's, that's the history to that. I, I would wish the opposition parties work closely together. We may have different ideologies, different policies, but you know, it is in the, our national interest that we work together amongst ourselves and have a stronger, stronger uh, opposition parties for this election. It doesn't seem to, to be, and that too disappoints me greatly. You're watching Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. Our guest tonight is Savinada Narumbe, the leader of Unity Fiji. Mr. Narumbe, in a campaign meeting uh, earlier this year, you had said that you were forced to lie and put a rosy picture about the economy to the world after December 2006 onwards when you were governor of Reserve Bank and you were later sacked in 2009. Did you give a rosy picture? What was the state then? Did you tell those that you were supposed to update the actual picture? Oh, well, that was quite simple. I told the truth of what was happening. So in a, after a military coup in any country, uh, the international communities and uh, foreign governments wouldn't talk to coup makers. They wouldn't. They would seek out somebody independent to tell them what is happening on the ground, like the governor of a reserve bank if it's there. So that's why uh, the interim administration was uh, telling me to, to, to put out a more rosier picture of what was happening. I, of course, refused. I said, no, I'm not going to, to change anything that is not on the ground. So I said, no. So I didn't, I didn't lie. I didn't paint any picture. So that's, uh, I, I think, was also one of the reasons I was kicked out of the Reserve Bank soon after they abrogated the, the 1997 Constitution. Questions are coming up. Why talk about it now? Why not then? What's your response to this? Why not talk about it now? Why not? I'm just saying huh? the questions yeah. are being asked. So I'm asking back, why not now? People are asking, huh? why not now? I you talked say about it, it in then? 2018. I'm talking about it again before this election in the campaign trail. That, that was not the first time for me to raise that issue. It is a good issue, it is an important issue. So I think the, the public needs to know. So, so I said, I didn't lie, so I told the international community and, of course, uh, everybody here what was happening. So when you, when you spoke to the international community at the time, you gave the actual picture? Yes. And you got into trouble for that? Yes, I think so. 
There were other issues about devaluing the Fiji dollar. Oh, that absolutely. Also come up. There was another, another issue. They said we should devalue the Fiji dollar. I, I told them, in when, my when view, was that? in my experience, I think that was 2008, 2009. In my experience, that was not the right time to devalue the Fiji dollar. Why? Because uh, a weaker Fiji dollar would mean that the cost of goods that we buy from abroad will be higher. It's, it was not the right time to burden people with higher cost of living at that time. So I didn't agree to that. So that's probably another reason why, why you I got was the boot. booted out of the, of the Reserve Bank. One week after I left, they devalued the Fiji dollar by 20%. Mr. Darumbe, I'll, I'll go into some issues where some statements have been made, and I will ask you about that. One was in the 2022-2023 national budget, the address mm -hmm. by the Minister for Economy, Aya Said Kayum. Uh, government debt was estimated at around $9.1 billion, or 89.4% of GDP at the end of July 2022. Mm -hmm. I said Kayum further said, in two years, the government lost about $2.8 billion in revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic. He says the average cost of our overall debt portfolio as of July was 4.4% of almost a quarter from pre-pandemic levels. He said that at least $100 million annual savings on interest payments, mainly due to government's ability to negotiate lower cost, policy-based loans, and concessional financing. So it came also said in the coming months, Fiji expects $1 billion in investments in the private sector. Foreign reserves also hit a record high, according to him, $3.62 billion equivalent to 8.4 months of imports and that was the statement from the mm -hmm. budget. Now, some think that government debt does not affect the ordinary person. Some say Fiji had to borrow as $2.8 billion in revenue was lost during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What is your assessment? Uh, that's a lot of figures you have quoted that, yeah. uh, including debt. Let's go, uh, let's go with growth. government debt yeah. and how it affects uh, people and right. what's your assessment on that? Yeah, you know, we, we all borrow. The public borrows. Uh, we borrow when our income is less than what we are spending. And that's what I've been uh, saying to, end, to this government for a long time. Their spending is too much. Not only spending is too much, they're wasting a lot of our money. Government doesn't have any money of, of itself. This is our money. This is the money that we give government. And that's the money that it uh, uh, provides the services back to us. So that is our money. And if it's wasting our money, we need to be concerned about it. Because that wastage is leading to a lot of borrowing. And uh, I've been telling this government a lot uh, also that you cannot grow an economy, a structure for economy like Fiji, on government borrowing. You can't. Or on government spending, to be more specific. You can't. So, because that is now leading to debt. So, what is wrong with debt? Because we have to repay debt. It's not a grant. We have to repay it. And this is what the law says. The government needs to pay debt first before it uh, uh, meets any other services. So, what is happening is every dollar that we pay the government in our taxes is paying 43 cents to pay for the debt. What does that leave? It leaves 57 cents for it to spend on everything else. Now, that 57 cents is leading to, it's not enough to pay for all the services that the government needs to provide to us. And the, and, and the, and the, the problem is this. If that debt continues to rise, whether it is low servicing, 4.5% of uh, of the average interest rate, whether it is from multilateral institutions, does not really matter. What matters is that debt servicing is rising, debt is increasing, and debt servicing is rising. So that 57 cents that I was talking about is now going to drop further. When that drops further, government will have to, to cut out, to cut down 
on many of those essential expenses. We are seeing that already. But that's what we call the crowding out impact of debt. So debt is now, that payment is now crowding out all the other expenses. So Which, we are essential feeling essential services that. like you're saying education, health, education, health, infrastructure. You know, infrastructure. That is what is going to be crowded out. Ultimately, that uh, crowding out is too much for government to operate properly, smoothly in its operation, and that's when the debt default starts. And when we default on our debt, we cannot pay our interest. We cannot pay our our principal. That's when really government curtails expenses. And if you were thinking that that will not affect you because you are out there in the outer islands or out there in the, in the villages, you, you are wrong. This will affect you as government cuts back on its expenses. It will affect your education of your children. It will affect you going to a health center where the bandages are not there, where all those kind of uh, essential uh, medical products are not there, it will affect you. It might affect government workers, which is done in many countries that have suffered a lot from this debt. So it is going to affect us all. It's going to create a, a lot of havoc. We have seen that around the world. So let's not go down that road. Let's cut let's back not, on expenses. You're saying let's not go down further down that road. Further down. Now, people can call us on 3314-766 or 7730-766 with your questions. And uh, you can also uh, post up your question using the hashtag straight, uh, Fiji Village Straight Talk. Uh, there's a question that was sent earlier. Uh, what will Mr. Narube do? What type of economic policy can he bring uh, to implement to reduce the debt to GDP ratio in Fiji? Yeah, it's not going to be easy. This debt has been accumulated over 16 years. So I think the, the solutions will have to be properly balanced with growing the economy. So if you go in too, too tough, then the economy will co collapse or decline, and that will create more problems for us. Our solutions is in our manifesto that we launched uh, last week. It is there. First, we need to reposition the economy. You know. We need to build a new foundation for the economy. We cannot build the economy on government spending. We cannot build the economy simply on tourism. We must involve the natural resources that we have. So we have in our manifesto a program we call Economic Transformation Program that will rebalance the economy to a, to a more stronger footing. The second, uh, is that we will then have to go at government reforms, reforms for government expenses. So that is what we're going to do, which means really we'll need to reduce or remove wastages that I believe is there. And then we need to refocus the expenses of ministries themselves to a more, uh, to a programs that will create uh, a better impact on, on the economy. Tell us about uh, the economic transformation program. What, what is that about? Uh, that will revolutionize this what, place. What is it? It is just based on natural resources. So just we, we need to uh, focus our energy more on natural resources. They are here. They, they are everywhere. But what have we done to natural resources? You see this government has ignored resource-based industry. You see sugar. You see timber, you see fishing, you see agriculture, boom, all going down. Hmm? So to me, it's a no-brainer. You go back to your natural resources. You go and build up your economic foundation from there. What are you going to do? We're going to provide machines to increase production. Secondly, we need to provide uh, processing centers that will uh, value add. And thirdly, provide market so we can sell those products. And in addition to that, we would like to provide capital. And we are establishing a commercial bank that is totally dedicated to this area. And thirdly, and 
Finally, we need to change the mindsets of the people. That is tough. Nobody has tried to do that. And I think if we are not going to change the mindset, those things that I mentioned before will still be an issue for us. So that is what... What is the mindset? Is. What mindset are you talking about? The mindsets that we need to change to more, be more productive, uh, to management of our, of our operations, the, man, uh, the mindsets to watch expenses, those are the kind of things. That Commercialized farming. Commercial farming is what will the key. Not only farming out there in, the, in what we get from uh, our, our, our fishing grounds could be also included. Timber also included. So those are the, the things that nobody has provided up to now. And that's exactly why we haven't grown. Uh, You're watching Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. We'll be back right after this break. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess in the study. When there's been Itoke leadership, everybody has been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he's not in government. You said that you couldn't pay out bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, USA, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? Fiji First Buy. cannot intervene into a personal matter. Absolutely, you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when he came up with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're a joke. Uh, no, you're a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. Don't bring it up. You don't. No, no, I gotta bring it up. You were commander. But yes, every military officer and serviceman at the time was under your. You've forgotten. You trade them. Bulovinaka. This is Fiji Village Street Talk. I am VJ Narayan. Fiji Village Trade Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Download the all new Fiji Village app. Get the latest news direct to your mobile. Get the latest sports updates from our scoreboards online. Navigate easily through our categories. Watch videos from Straight Talk interviews, local music videos, sports and many more. You can now easily listen to your favorite radio stations from your phone. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. This is Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Our guest tonight is the leader of Unity Fiji, Mr. Savanada Narumbe. You can call us with your questions or most of the questions are being sent through. You can uh, also post on uh, uh, Fiji Village Straight Talk with a, has a hashtag Fiji Village Straight Talk. Now, cost of living. Uh, a lot of questions has come through. I'll, I'll read this from some students of USP. Mm -hmm. This is from them. Mr. Narumbe, what are your plans for the students who are studying in USP, renting in Suva, as we can't afford to pay high rent with groceries and other expenses? Even with the TELS allowance, most of the money is just spent on rent. We are left nothing to eat sometimes. Mm. What's your message yeah, I, I think that uh, is a true reflection of what's happening around Fiji. Uh, right now, we came out of the pandemic straight into this crisis on the cost of living. And uh, I think we haven't handled that. The government hasn't handled that very well up to now. And uh, I think there's a lot of people who will relate uh, to that particular student. That the cost of rent or the rent is going up, the cost of food is going up. So where's the money going to come from? You know? So that's the uh, big issue for us. I think what the government has done is just to blame the, the international developments for that. I think it needs to do more. And in our manifesto, we need to, we're doing two things to address this uh, crisis on the cost of living. First, we're putting more money into people's pockets. And second, 
we, we will reduce the cost of imported uh, products. So let me go on the first one, uh, putting more money into people's pockets. We, we are going to increase the threshold of taxes, income taxes, from $30,000 to $40,000. That means another additional uh, people will not pay taxes. The second, we will reduce the income taxes of those paying between $40,000 and $50,000. Uh, third, we will uh, increase uh, what we call the living wages, not the minimum wage because the living wages, which is linked to poverty, will in increase that to $5 an hour, immediately once we get into government. Uh, because we think that uh, the wages are well below the basic poverty line. And we need to raise that. We're also doing away with the no jab, no job uh, policy. Uh, I think that was too draconian, too, too restrictive when we were just getting out of, uh, of, pen, of the pandemic. Uh, there's a few others that, uh, that uh, doesn't come to mind right now. Uh, we are reimbursing uh, uh, withdrawals from FNPF due to COVID for or salary earners up to $40,000. Uh, we are shifting or lifting the retirement age from 55 to 60. So those are the, the, the issues, I think, most of them, uh, to put more money into people's pockets. The second is that we want to reduce the cost of imported uh, goods because that's, that's what is coming. The higher inflation abroad is being brought home to Fiji because of uh, imported goods, the cost of it. So we're going to review uh, the border taxes for essential items that may still be, uh, be imposed with, uh, with taxes. The second, we will increase uh, the list of items under price control, uh, and that would include rent, with this question that was mentioned. Uh, that we need to have a moratorium on rent. And thirdly, uh, we need to talk to the oil companies and look at a framework where they, we can ask them to also absorb some of the increase uh, in, uh, in the fuel prices coming from abroad. Because the whole issue of uh, cost of living is what I know, is that the burden of it is excessively on those that cannot afford it. There's nothing been done to, to, to support those people. The poor are carrying this burden of living more than anyone else. So we need to support them and need to rebalance it from those that are can afford to those that cannot afford. So that's our uh, menu for, for the cost of living. It needs to be addressed immediately. The oil companies, you're saying, uh, you, you just... How will you do that for them to bear some of the cost? They will say that uh, this is due to world oil prices. Yeah. How, how will you deal with it? Rather than pass on all the increases in the world price, can they absorb some? The private sector. Oil is a big issue for us. It, uh, the increase in oil prices permeates right throughout the economy. So why don't we explore that option? Oil, uh, uh, the fuel prices is under price control. And each time they want an increase in, uh, in the price of fuel, they, they, they apply to the price control for, uh, for the increase in prices. There is a template that is used there to calculate the, the increase in prices. So you'll review that template? We will going to review that template with the consultations with, uh, with the oil company. We'll stick to uh, cost of living. Uh, questions continue to come about that. It's a major concern for many. People are concerned about increasing food prices. Mm. It is getting harder to put food on the table. Uh, according to the Fiji Bureau of Statistics Household and Income Survey uh, that was done pre-COVID in 2020, 24.1% mm. or 208,021 people at that time, which equates to about 45,744 households living on or below the poverty line. Mm. Now, the basic needs poverty line, according to the statistics, mm. is $41 mm. 
Forty-one dollars uh, for eight, ninety-one cents per adult equivalent per week, mm. which is the basic needs poverty line, and definitely mm. it's very low. People cannot survive on that. Uh, what What is your plan? Yeah, poverty is. Uh, Sorry, what is your assessment first of all? Because that's pre-COVID, that statistic. Mm. Have you made some estimates based on where it's, it may be sitting now and what is your Oh, estimate? absolutely. Uh, I think that was uh, pre-COVID. And if you include the, the impact of COVID, which is on incomes, and also this uh, increase in the cost of living, we think that the basic poverty line of $42 per week per adult uh, has now gone up. Yeah, and we calculate now that uh, if you... Consider that, then your poverty indicator as percentage of uh, population would now be close to 40%. And that's a huge number. Uh, that's about close to 400,000 people under poverty in Fiji. And also uh, that uh, household incomes and uh, expenditure survey also indicated the distribution of this poverty amongst the ethnic groups. The Itoke makes up three quarters of that uh, of that uh, people living in poverty. So that's what drives your your response to poverty. So we are driving it through the economic transformation reform uh, program, where the, the 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 people out there in the rural areas make use of uh, the 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 program to get more money, and that. Uh, to me, will uh, increase their, their incomes, and that will also flow into the economy. So we rebase it, more jobs, more, more incomes, and that is, is the platform for, for, for poverty incomes. And then, of course, what the, the very important to that as well uh, is education. Education is the key out of poverty. Uh, so we are changing our, our education program, particularly the tertiary education, and uh, we are making tertiary education free. Free. And we are forgiving the debt on tests. When will you do that? When will you, do, when will you bring those two initiatives? Take okay. away the tells debt because we had a lot of questions about that. People saying, uh, students saying they had uh, de tells debts totaling about thirty thousand, couldn't get a job. Sure. Worried about that, so all of that gone. Mm. Yeah. And, so, and and you'll make tertiary education. We, we'll do that straight away. Straight off, straight, yeah, straight away. If you do yes, come sir. into government. Yeah. When, when we come into government. Mr. Narumbe, in relation to tertiary education. There's a question that came through from uh, Thomas uh, about free education, including tertiary studies. Can you explain how will your government pay for that? Uh, how are we going to pay for free education? From the budget. And as I said, there's a lot of wastage in the budget. We have identified $1 billion of wastage in the budget one year, in one year, one billion that we could say. Imagine that. We have been in, in government for 16 years. So imagine we could have saved about $14 billion in the last 16 years. Where would we have spent it? One of them is education. So that's what we're going to do. That savings we will, we will rechannel to priority areas like education, health law and order, and housing. So that's where we're getting the money for... We'll talk for about education. wastage after this, and you'll have to break it down where you'll get, where do you see wastage. Mm -hmm. But just a question from Minesh Bhagwan. He's asking, what impact the higher wage rate will have on the ordinary Fijians in the long run? Would it affect the price of goods and services that they buy or use? Yeah, uh, wages uh, has cyclical impact. Uh, the, the workers receive higher wages, they spend that money, that benefits who? 
the shopkeepers, the small businesses, the big businesses. So that comes back as a cyclical impact of uh, that higher wages. But the employer pays wages, so he has to get that from somewhere. One thing they could do is cut down on their profit margin if that is, too, that is still there. Hmm? One the other, thing they could do is pass it down to the consumers. They, they will pass it down to consumers. Hmm? So that could also, also happen. How will, you, how will you control that or what will you do? I, I think uh, what they pass down to the consumers would depend on the kind of product that they, so they That's they where you're sell. thinking of bringing price control. Yeah, we could do that, uh, particularly the essential items. Uh, we could relook at... Uh, uh, the the border taxes on that as well as well, what I've said already. So those are the kind of things uh, that we could do. The border taxes, import duties, they they bring money to the government. So if you reduce that, where else can you get money from? Just spend less. Spend less. Tighten up the belt. Absolutely. On uh, tertiary education, tells that a question coming through. Some are asking if you start paying for everybody, where is the accountability? And will students just continue to have this expectation? Is this sustainable? Hmm. Yeah, there's there to be checks and balances in that, uh, in, the, in, in that uh, scholarship uh, facility, uh, to ensure that performance are maximized by students. If they don't perform, of course, we could withdraw that uh, scholarship temporarily until they, they then come back. Uh, with some. So it's not going to be an open ladder. It has to be checks and balances and controls to ensure that students actually succeed in their education. There's a question here. What is uh, uh, Mr. Narumbe's thoughts on this? Why are old people still in parliament? Can give chance to the young ones to lead this nation? Absolutely. The leadership around the world, as you see, some countries are getting younger and younger. Uh, and I think, to me, that's a good sign. Yeah. To me, in Fiji, we need to perhaps recycle and, and do some of those things, get some younger people back uh, into, into parliament. Uh, we, we have some old people in there, I agree with it. But old people also have experience and they also contribute to it. So, balance, of course. The other question is, what are your plans in uh, paying our debt? That's approximately $10 billion. Yeah. The, as I said, the, the first thing we need to do is control expenses because that's what is in our control. We don't control revenue too much. Let's be honest sometimes. So we need to control expenses. We'll take away waste, remove waste, just redirect the expenses to more priority areas, and that will slow down your borrowing. Grow the economy, particularly through the economic transformation program. Grow the economy, get more cyclical impact of the revenue flowing back to government. So that increases their capacity to pay for service of debt. So over time, your economy grows more than your debt, and your debt to GDP ratios goes down. That's how we're going to do it. Quick question from Rajnal Singh. He's saying, my question to Mr. Narumbe is, what is his plans uh, on electricity supply to those who live in Cunningham area, uh, not too far from Suva City, and still do not have EFL power? Oh, we'll have to look at uh, us EFL, why that is happening. It's probably a technical issue. Uh, if it is, it needs to be addressed. Uh, if it's uh, something else, something more serious than that, then we'll have to address that. But they, they are in the grid. They, they should be getting electricity. So it must be just a technical relay issue of uh, electricity, I'm thinking. So that could be easily solved, whether EFL has uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity and the resources to do it, we'll... We'll have to address that. You're watching Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Mr. Narumbe, let's go to wastage. You have mm. stated there's a lot of wastage. What are some areas, as far as government expenditure is concerned, 
where you have noted wastage and what will you do? Yeah, I've been singing this song of wastages for a long time. Uh, and we have gone into ministries themselves and tried to identify uh, what we could save with that. Uh, so firstly, we're looking at the big transfers of government. Transfer is just grants that goes to public companies, including FBC, a few others that uh, receive these grants. Why are we supplying these grants from our taxpayers' funds? How are these grants going, uh, are being used by these uh, statutory bodies, public companies? We need to address them. So we need to lift or review the efficiencies of this. So that's a huge grant, capital as well as uh, operational grants, running into about $700 million a year. You know? How much of that can we save? I don't know. We have said 30% of that can be saved. And that's a huge chunk of that saving. The second is that there are many programs and uh, expenditures that are made by ministries that have been there for ages. They haven't been reviewed. So what we're saying, we're going to review all the ministry's expenses. Start from ground zero, what we're calling a zero-based budget, and every ministry needs to argue out every cent that uh, be allocated to them. That's fresh start. Huh? Then that's one way for us to, to really save uh, a lot of money. The, the others are our missions abroad. They said we have too many missions abroad and we don't know what the benefits of some of those missions. And that doesn't make sense to us. The third is vehicles. Vehicles, when I was in government, was about $1 million, $2 million. Now it's in the tune of $20 million. $30 million a year. So we need to do away with that. Uh, we need to cut that down. So th those are some of the big Less areas. government vehicles? Less government vehicles. We'll take away the tinted part of that vehicle. Why should it be tinted? Why are they hiding inside the vehicle? So we'll remove that. You're watching Straight Talk on Fiji Village. I am Vijay Narayan. We'll be back after this break. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess we started. When there has been Itoke leadership, everybody has been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he is not in government. You said that you couldn't pay out bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, USA, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? Fiji First Buy cannot it. intervene into a personal matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when he came out with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're uh, a joke. No, you're, you are a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. You don't bring that up. You don't no, no, I didn't bring it up. You were commander. But yes, Every but military officer and serviceman at the time was under your command. You've forgotten you trade them. Bulovinaka, this is Fiji Village Street Talk. I am Vijay Narayan. Fiji Village Trade Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Download the all new Fiji Village app. Get the latest news direct to your mobile. Get the latest sports updates from our scoreboards online. Navigate easily through our categories. Watch videos from Straight Talk interviews, local music videos, sports and many more. You can now easily listen to your favorite radio stations from your phone. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. Fiji Village Straight Talk. I am Vijay Narayan. Our guest tonight, the leader of Unity Fiji, Mr. Savenada Narumbe. We are talking about the economy and connected things to that and what mm. we can do about it. Uh, let's go to the next question is about civil servants. Mm -hmm. They're asking about their pay, whether you will cut their pay because mm -hmm. issues about wasted etc. came in. Uh, contracts, retirement age and 
civil service conditions. Mm. Yep. No, we are not going to cut uh, civil service pay. Um, if anything, we could cut the prime, uh, the, the minister's pay. But uh, no, uh, we 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 suggested uh, cutting the minister's pay, and I think they had some pay cuts uh, on uh, contracts of civil service. Uh, civil servants will uh, remove the contracts of uh, of civil servants except term for contracts. the three yeah the term contracts except for the three top positions which are the directors the deputy secretary and the secretary uh, and we are going to increase uh, the retirement age from 55 to to 60 uh, we're going to try to bring back uh, the PSC arrangement that we had uh, before for more consistency, performance-driven uh, reforms in, uh, in the civil servants. Those are our issues on civil service. Plans for roads, infrastructure, water supply, mm. uh, what are your plans? Oh, I think that is a big dark tunnel for us. Uh, I say that because there has been a lot of allocation to roads, water, but we don't seem to see the results of that, the result of that uh, millions of dollars which we have, alloc government has allocated to, to roads. You see our roads, this government has, hasn't really uh, constructed any new roads, very few, if any. So we will really look at uh, Fiji Roads Authority, review uh, their setup, and also look at how they are spending our money. I, I'm, I'm very pleased today that uh, roads are getting better, at least uh, around Suwa, and uh, the CEO of, uh, of Fiji Roads Authority is a local now. So with the local, we are getting better results than expected before. So that means there's something that could be done to improve uh, our roads and the efficiency of the allocation. Will you continue roads. the project, uh, the, the freeway across Viti Levu? That's been talked about. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a red herring. Uh, I think it's just being thrown in to, to muddy the waters. Uh, I think it, uh, you just discard that. Uh, why do you spend billions of dollars when our health system is struggling, when our poor is struggling, and everything else uh, needs to be improved? We, we need to be quite realistic in where we spend our scarce resources. And building that road, to me, is a pie in the sky. Forget it. Tura from Suva asking you, Mr. Narumbe, what are your plans in relation to the military budget? Yeah, we've seen the growth in the military budget. We have highlighted in our manifesto, uh, comparing the allocation to housing uh, against the military budget. Uh, I think uh, we need to be realistic there. We will examine the priorities of government. We will bring up the, the, the areas of education, health, uh, housing, and law and order. That's the police, not the military. So we will then have to look at the military's budget and, and accordingly have that uh, reprioritized. There's a question from Sailasa Ratuni Vambea. How will you address the increase in unemployment in Fiji, especially for those students who are graduated from university, still unemployed, Number of graduates continue to increase due to free education, but these graduates are struggling to find a job. How will you address this? Yeah, uh, you know, jobs are created by the private sector. We have the, the government and the public sector creating jobs, but they have very limited potential to do that. So the engine of growth is really the private sector. So we must grow the private sector. This government has intervened too much into the private sector. So we'll remove that intervention. Let the private, center, uh, uh, private sector flourish on their own uh, initiative and incentives. And I think that ETP, Economic Transformation Program, that will create a lot of employment, particularly for rural areas. So that's uh, one way uh, our thinking on uh, creating more jobs. Questions about housing again. Many people say they cannot own their own mm. homes. They keep working, cannot own their own homes. Rent is quite high. What is your plan? Yeah. The price of building is, is quite excessive now because of uh, 
uh, price of materials coming from abroad uh, and uh, speculative uh, building of uh, or purchasing of, uh, of homes. So we're going to look at housing. It's a serious one and uh, we're going to spend $100 million on housing. The spent by government up to now is around $15 million a year. We're going to raise that to $100 million a year. And we estimate we can build about uh, 1,000 homes per year, you know, using those uh, funds. And that includes not only homes in the urban centers, but also rural. And who qualifies those for those houses? Yeah, we'll, we'll need to go look at uh, the certain qualifications for that uh, based on uh, incomes, based on needs. So that uh, will be part of the of the process, but we just need to plow in more money into that uh, housing, and that includes the resettlement or the up uh, of the uh, of of these uh, what we call informal set settlements. Yeah, so that will be part of that program. About USP, how will you deal with USP? They have not received Fijian government grants mm -hmm. totaling more than sixty million. The number continues to increase. No end in sight. Uh, what will you do? Yeah, uh, that is uh, indeed an unfortunate, uh, sad uh, development. Uh, that government has withdrawn their support for USP, affected the youth's uh, uh, education and their employment. So we're going to restore the grants to USP. When will you do that? Yeah, I think we'll do that as straight as, uh, as we go, uh, as we enter government. So uh, we believe their allocation already uh, in government, waiting for release. There was a question asked in a press conference of Fiji First General Secretary. When this question was asked, uh, he said some of the parties are saying that uh, we will give money to USP as they are owed. Uh, he said there should be audits done before that based on the Audit Risk Committee. And he also uh, labelled it as vote buying, that some mm. parties are using that to say, if you vote for us, we'll give USP the money. As a leader of <coughs> Unity Fiji, what's your comment on that? Yeah, uh, Well, always two sides of the argument. Uh, I think for, for, for us, for many of us, we're seeing that uh, there's uh, injustice to the students of USP. Whatever is the good governance uh, issue that uh, this, uh, this government and uh, the USP management, it needs to be addressed. And there is a council there that is addressing it. Leave it to the council. They address it. Why would the minister be saying something outside that council? I, I have confidence in the council. They can address that. And they have addressed it. So that's it. If, if any member of that council disagrees with the council, he takes it to the council. Why is he airing that differences outside it? I think there's a draconian measures that will hurt our students more, and that is based on the wrong assumption of good governance. So you leave it to the USP council, give the money that's owed to them. Absolutely. You have some specific plans for ETOK and uh, multiculturalism. I see that in your manifesto. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about bringing back the Great Council of Chiefs. Uh, you've got that in your manifesto. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is important to bring it back and in which form? Yeah, I've asked that question a, a lot. And I, my straight answer is that why not? Why not? What has the Great Council of Chiefs deserved not to be reinstated? What have they done that they don't have to be reinstated? These chiefs uh, are quite important into the fabric of uh, Itoke, which makes up over 60% of this population, 60%. And that uh, is part of their culture. And I think they should be given a role, a national role, uh, in this country. And we are restoring Great Council of Chiefs, and we are refocusing their terms of reference more towards economic and social development in their own provinces. I was looking at your manifesto and one of the things in the budget was that I noticed that you have a 450 million grant as part of your uh, revenue that will mm -hmm. be coming in the money that, that's expected to come in in a proposed budget. 
Uh, where and how will you get that huge amount of grants? Yeah, I think we could access a lot more uh, from the international communities if we package our, our, our expenses right, uh, that we for, follow the guidelines that they, they, they require and match the preferences of those donors uh, to the expenses. So that's what we believe we can get. Uh, from new money from our donors. I think it's out there. Uh, we'll, we'll exploit it more than this government. So there's about 245 million in the current budget, 2022, 2023, mm. expected to almost double that. Yeah. We're confident How quickly that we can could you do package that? Our, our expenses, right? And that focuses on uh, the priority areas. I think we'll pick up those donors. The traditional as well as the non-traditional donors. You're looking at income tax threshold, personal income tax threshold, uh, to increase it to uh, forty thousand dollars. That means those who earn forty thousand dollars or less, if Unity Fiji comes in, mm -hmm. will not pay that personal income right. tax. What happens to those who are earning above that? Will you increase the personal income taxes for those people? What we're doing for income taxes and tax in general is to rebalance uh, the books. Uh, Currently now, as we see the, the situation, particularly of the cost of living, we want to rebalance it, redistribute taxes from the rich to the poor. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So how, yeah. how, how much, what would be the scale that you'll start increasing the taxes? Oh, 40,000 less, we, no one pays any personal income tax. Which ones you'll be targeting? We are raising the taxes of what we call uh, the... Social responsibility tax. Those above 270,000? 270,000. So those who are above 270,000. I'm sure they can afford it. Any plans on what? Go to what? Go hmm? to what level of increase? Have you thought of that for them? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I don't have. Uh, the, the numbers have been crunched uh, in there. But so they, will, they will expect increases if you do come in. Yeah. I mean, not much increase, but I think there will be increased SRT. That's a, that's a temporary surcharge until we review the economy in the next two years. Mr. Narumbe, Elisa Dinono has sent a question. In the media, he says, we have seen the impact of removing corporal punishment from our school system. He says the behavior, according to him, uh, of students is deteriorating every year. And this has contributed to many social issues faced in Fiji. What are your plans in tackling this problem with our children or future of Fiji? And will you reintroduce corporal punishment? Okay, corporal punishment. Uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, as you know, uh, no teacher or even parents allowed uh, to instill a corporal uh, punishment on the children. Uh, I think that uh, move needs to be relooked at. I, I, I am. Uh, very keen to see that proper education is done before anything like that should be done, to remove that suddenly. Because for most of our cultures, that has been part of that culture. But we, we need to ensure the protection of the child. And, and that's the balance. The protection must be there, but I'm sure we could look at a, a system that works on uh, getting discipline into our children. Because that will help them. Discipline in the form of corporal punishment, or are you just talking about? So there are different ways of, yeah, of disciplining. So you're Certainly. not saying corporal punishment? I'm not saying corporal punishment. Strict discipline. Yeah, we, we need to instill that into the society. A lot of talk about uh, the education curriculum, that uh, we need a review of this. Uh, Unity Fiji, what's, what's your stand on that? Yeah, we have watched uh, a lot of policies, including uh, curriculum development uh, the, in the last uh, 10 years. We think they have gone the wrong end. They've gone the wrong end. And this uh, stop start, sometimes the reversal of education policy, not helping our children. There's been a lot of reversals of uh, policies in education. So we will uh, revamp all that, overhaul the education policies, we look at all of them uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a commission, perhaps, education commission to relook at uh, all of that and put that straight. There's another question. Uh, a young farmer 
Mm. He's been trying his best to get an export license. However, the requirement to get one is very hard, according to him. In the media, we have seen that the Yangona industry is in the millions. Majority of the, these are middlemen who have uh, export mm. licenses, are reaping the reward from this industry, leaving the actual farmers who are the main suppliers of Yangona with less because of the un, what he calls unfair system they have put in the local market. What are your views on this and how can you ensure that the Yangona farmers get a fair share in this million dollar industry? Yeah, sure. I, I fully sympathize with the questioner. I, I think Yangona has a, a lot of potential. If you see all the crops that uh, we sell abroad, Yangona is the one that is rising. And that's potential there for this uh, industry. We haven't uh, given the support that this industry needs. So we're going to give it through the economic transformation program. They are going to farm us and the value adding that can be done here in Fiji and uh, that value adding processing centers for Angona and all the others will be owned by the farmers themselves or the suppliers themselves. So that will retain a lot of uh, income with the farmers and they can even export those themselves. So the, the, the roles that these middlemen are doing, they, the farmers will now do it under the ETP. So they have the income rather than the middlemen. And that will increase uh, a lot of Angola production and foreign exchange as we sell them abroad. Mr. Narumbe, a question from Minesh. What policy will you put in place to address labor shortage problems which Fiji is now facing, even in uh, manufacturing industries like garment and printing? Hmm. Labor shortage. Okay, that's uh, something new I, uh, I haven't caught up with. Uh, but if we are facing labor shortage, why are we facing it? Because are there immigration? Are they leaving Fiji? Uh, I think the, the answer to that is uh, we just train more. Train more of uh, whatever skills that, uh, that are gaps in those skills here in Fiji. So if there's uh, in the manufacturing sector, the manufacturing sector could participate with the government in training uh, new, new workers in that area. I've got a question from Fazia from Suva. Will your party adopt a national policy to tackle Fiji's growing mental health crisis? Oh yes, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very important area. The social impact of this uh, crisis pandemic as well as the cost of living is huge. It's huge. It's a crisis in itself, the social issues, including uh, the, the issue that he has raised. So we need to address that by looking at the various bodies that, that provides that and uh, make sure that they are fully resourced to do that. And of course, jobs are the most important uh, uh, long-term sustainable solution to that, and we have covered that. Now, in relation to health, I'll just go back to that because mm. some questions continue coming up. Uh, a, a total overhaul is needed according to some of the people, equipment, etc. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any plans on that as far oh, as yes. health is concerned? Oh, yes. What yes. are your plans? So we are plowing uh, 200 million additional dollars to help in our reprioritization of, of government expenses. And what will, what, what will be the target areas? Yeah, I think the target areas we can see is the infrastructure. You see from CWM, you just look at the infrastructure. You don't think there's uh, people inside. But uh, what does a coat of paint would do to that building? How much will it cost? Very little. What has, hasn't been done because of the priorities given to help? We look at uh, equipment inside. Many say that a lot are not working, and, and that's probably true. The provisions of uh, basic health items, bandages, and all those things, plaster, cotton wool, those would be uh, something that will be supported by that additional uh, $200 million a year to help. Mr. Narumbe, we're coming to, towards the end of the program. Mm. Uh, there was... Uh, also issues in relation to heart care. Uh, we have uh, heart surgeries now being done 
in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's been some questions raised about total heart care. For mm -hmm. example, uh, pacemaker services, mm -hmm. permanent pacemaker services, people who have just lower heart rates that we can get a pacemaker fitted in and mm. as long as you keep checking and the batteries are working and mm. you have that uh, continuous supply, that, that right. should be fine. And uh, NGOGram, cath mm -hmm. lab equipment. Have you, have, have you looked at those things? Because Fiji mm. has got one of the highest rates of heart problems, heart attacks, mm. uh, NCDs in the world. Yeah, I, I think that's really part of the components of uh, the reforms in, uh, in health that we will look at. Uh, I, I know tourism come here, some are quite elderly, and it's important that we provide that services uh, to them that they can be comfortable with. So yeah, there's some improvements that have been done. But I think for health, we must keep in mind that the, that's the right of people to, to access proper health services. So the cost of that access needs to be taken into account. We cannot privatize hospitals and allow them to, to, to impose higher and higher tariffs because we won't be able to afford it. What good is a good health services if you can't afford it? I think that's the, the kind of balance we'll bring to that health reforms. Tariffing, tariffs as well as the quality of right services. Right now, the one in the West, Aspen, is providing free surgeries mm. Uh, for people, uh, will you continue with that? Or will oh, absolutely, that? absolutely. If it's uh, free uh, and it's providing uh, quite essential services in that very high technical issue, yes, we'll continue. That. Mr. Narumbe, how many seats are you targeting to get in this election? And as some say, you won't meet the five percent threshold. That more parties, splitting of the votes, etc. And do you believe have, you have the right lineup of candidates to deliver this mammoth task that you're saying you'll do this, you'll do that? Definitely need, you need the right group of people to do that. Yeah, let's start with that. Yeah, I think our lineup is quite strong. We have a leader of opposition in it. We have a minister, a former minister. We have former permanent secretaries. We have doctors. We have uh, lecturers. We have uh, lawyers. So, yeah. We have a very, very good team. But uh, this team, as, uh, as I say, ministers, they are supported by the civil service. So they're, they're the ones that will be going more on technical issues and advising uh, the ministers. The ministers themselves will just need to, to direct as well as uh, develop policies and, uh, and strategies of it. Uh, the issue of uh, the, the threshold, uh, yeah, we, 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 as, I, as I mentioned, the 2018 election, forget about it. It's done. And I think we cannot refer to it as far as unity Fiji is concerned because we have done uh, three years of awareness up to now. So we, we think that uh, uh, our realistic target is 18 seats. 18. We're not talking about just the threshold anymore. 18 seats. And our ideal target, and we are going in our assessment from the realistic towards the ideal in the next three weeks, four weeks that is left, is to run the government, is to win government. 28 seats. If it comes to negotiations, if, if no one hits that 28 or more than 28, who will you be ready to work with? Yeah, I've said that, uh, you know, Tifiji has made that uh, quite clear already at least for the last six months. Uh, I came into politics basically because I thought this government needs to go. Uh, they needs to be taken out of power. And that means, and I've said that, that when, if there's no government that wins government, uh, no, no political party that wins government, uh, we're, we're quite ready to form uh, a coalition amongst the opposition parties. But okay. we will not, form a coalition with Fiji First. So everyone except Fiji First? Everyone except Fiji First. So you can work with People's Alliance? Yes. Uh, Labour, NFP? Yeah. Anyone. Anyone. Mr. Narumbe, thank you again mm. for uh, availing yourself for our viewers and listeners uh, tonight. Uh, we definitely 
Uh, we'll see you again because mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at a few debates in the coming weeks and uh, a leaders debate, uh, which I talked about last night. Uh, we now have uh, confirmations from two leaders. Mr. Narumbe confirming tonight mm -hmm. that he will be here at 7 p.m. December 11th. That's a Sunday uh, uh, for the leaders debate. We have sent out invitations uh, for all leaders to attend. Uh, the leaders identified uh, invitations have gone out to the Fiji First uh, and we have invited the Prime Minister as the Fiji First leader to attend. Uh, we have invited uh, Sodelpa leader William Ngavoka. He's accepted our invitation. He's in on December 11th at 7 p.m. Mr. Narumbe confirming mm -hmm. in on December 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, we have uh, pending confirmations uh, from uh, the People's Alliance leader, uh, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka, uh, Labour Party leader, Mahendra Chaudhary, uh, National Federation Party leader, Professor Biman Prasad. And we'll be updating you on that as we have a great lineup of people again uh, next week. Straight Talk we will take a break for the next few days and come back uh, next Tuesday uh, Tuesday night. We, uh, stay, stay with us. We'll be telling you from our radio stations and also on our uh, website, Fiji Village, our platforms on uh, uh, who is uh, expected to come next. Uh, next Thursday, we have the supervisor of elections here, uh, Mohammed Sanim. Uh, that would be the 17th of November. And of course, we have the candidates ball draw. That's when the numbers get allocated to the candidates on the 18th of November or any other day. Uh, before that, if that happens. So uh, we also will have uh, further debates in relation to the economy, where we have uh, sent out invites again to different parties, and we are awaiting confirmation from that. Uh, Mr. Narumbe has confirmed tonight he's ready for the debate on the economy with the others. Uh, we also have uh, a debate planned with women uh, candidates from different parties, and we will be uh, getting that out for you. We also have a special debate for the younger people in each party. So a lot will happen on Straight Talk in the next few weeks. Uh, stay with us and have a good evening.